Hello, my name is Mr. Eichert. Welcome to my world, the world of Eichert, where we learn how to think like the College Board and get fives on the AP World History exam. This is part two of a lesson about topic 1.1, developments in East Asia. And today we're focusing on economics and technology. Part one was about politics and culture. So if you haven't checked that out yet, I highly recommend doing so. Let's get right into the course and exam description and see what the College Board has to say about these historical themes as they relate to topic 1.1. Here we are again in the CED unit guides for topic 1.1. So in the last video, which was part one, we already covered governance and we already covered culture. Today we are looking at the economics systems. And let's take a look right at the learning objective. Explain the effects of innovation on the Chinese economy over time. If we go over here to the historical developments, we will see that the economy of Song China became increasingly commercialized while continuing to depend on free peasant and artisanal labor. So free peasants and artisanal labor, that looks like that's a continuity. This process of becoming commercialized seems like it's a change. Look down here, the economy of Song China flourished as a result of, which is a causation phrase, increased productive capacity. So productive capacity increasing causes the economy to flourish. We're also looking at expanding trade networks and innovations in agriculture and manufacturing. And if we look over here, we see all of the technological innovations. For example, Champa rice, transportation innovations like the Grand Canal expansion, steel and iron production, and textiles and porcelains for export. First, let's talk about yet another continuity in China. Did, have I said continuity yet? Only like a hundred times. Well, that's good, because when you think about Chinese history, you should always be thinking about continuities. One thing that stays the same in Chinese economics is that much of the economy depends on agriculture, which is true for most of the states in Unit 1, whether they're farming rice, wheat, or any other staple crops. And these farms are mostly worked by peasants, who generally work on farms owned by landlords. It wasn't uncommon for men, women, and children all to be farming in the peasant class together. Free peasants means that first, they're not slaves. They're not owned by their landlords and they have some amount of rights. Also, they're not serfs, which means they're not bound to the land. Another important aspect of the economy and another continuity is that China was the world's leading producer of luxury goods. For example, things like porcelain, also called China. I wonder where they came up with that name. <laughs> Perhaps the most famous luxury good they traded was silk. In fact, silk was so famous that they named the most famous trade route after it, the Silk Road. Actually, the Silk Roads, because they're not just one road, which stretch all the way from China across the Eurasian landmass to the Mediterranean Sea. As far back as the Han Dynasty and probably before, Chinese goods, including silk and porcelain, had been highly valued and traded along this route. Shouldn't the Silk Roads be their own key term, Mr. Eichert? Well, yes, it should, and there's a whole topic devoted to it in Unit 2. Actually, during the Song Dynasty, trade on the Silk Roads was in decline because the Song didn't have the military strength to defend these routes like the Tang and the Han had been able to do before them. But China doesn't just trade on the Silk Roads. It also traded luxury goods on the vast Indian Ocean trade routes. And during the Song Dynasty, trade on the Indian Ocean increased just as the trade on the Silk Roads was decreasing. These luxury goods had traditionally always been made with the skilled labor of artisans. Now these are people who specialize in making stuff. And just like centuries before, and just like today, people around the world are buying lots of stuff made in China. Another economic continuity during the Song Dynasty was the tribute trade system. This is a way that China interacts with neighboring states. China, Zhongguo, means the middle country, often translated as the middle kingdom the center of culture, the center of political power, and the center of economics. In order to establish an economic relationship with a Chinese dynasty, other countries would send ambassadors to kowtow before the emperor, acknowledge his greatness as the son of heaven, and bring tribute. In return, the Chinese would often bestow gifts to the other states as a sign of appreciation. This had been going on again, at least since the Han Dynasty. But remember, the Song Dynasty is not quite as powerful as the other previous dynasties. So in many cases, this tribute trade system had actually evolved into the Song Dynasty paying money to people like the Jin Dynasty to not attack them. Fortunately for the Song, they're super rich and they could afford to keep doing that. But with other states that were less of a threat, like say those in Korea or Vietnam, this tribute relationship continued to function in a similar way. So these are all continuities that you need to know for economics. 
Are you guys ready for a big change and also a great example of causation? Oh, I can't wait. I'm bristling with anticipation. Champa rice. Rice. Yeah, it's a really big deal and it's super exciting. It goes all the way back to the tribute trade system we just talked about. Now, Champa was a kingdom in what is now southern Vietnam, and they had this rice. Oh, this rice was so good. How good was it, Mr. Eichert? The best. It was drought resistant, so you could plant it in places where you couldn't imagine rice would grow. It grew twice as fast, so you could have two harvests a year. By the time you get to the Ming Dynasty, they even had strains that gave you three harvests a year. That's some good rice right there. So, on one of these tribute missions, the Champa people brought their Champa rice to Song, China. And then do you know what happened? They had more rice? Yes, so much more rice. And what do you think that might lead to? More people! And what do all those people do? Grow more rice. Well, yeah, many of them do, but if you get double harvest, then you don't need as many people growing rice. They can do other stuff. Actually, they might have to do other stuff if they're not needed on the farm. What kind of stuff, Mr. Eichard? They can move to cities, which leads to urbanization. China had dozens of cities with more than 100,000 people when Europe had almost none. They could make porcelain and textiles for export, which leads to commercialization. What's that mean? Commercialization means that people produce stuff to sell and export, rather than producing stuff for local consumption. Yes, exactly. They can also make manufactured goods, which leads to proto-industrialization. Proto-industrialization. Yes, that's our next key term. Song China is making a ton of stuff, not just porcelain and textiles, okay? Specifically, lots of iron and steel, and they're making them on a large scale. Iron and steel for military purposes, religious purposes, and economic purposes. And they're using huge amounts of coal as fuel. And they're getting paid in cash. And what do you think they're spending their money on? Rice. Well, mostly, yes, but many people had money left over for things like entertainment and other food. And think about it, manufactured goods from other cities. So you can see that proto-industrialization and commercialization and urbanization all mutually cause each other. You just blew my mind. Mr. Eicher, China's a very big state. How did they transport all of these goods from one city to another? Ooh, another great question, my young friend. Canals and roads, most famously the Grand Canal. It's a canal that stretches from north to south of China for a thousand miles, connecting the two main rivers of China, the Yellow River and the Yangtze. The Yangtze! Actually, it's pronounced Yangtze, also called the Changjiang. I wouldn't mind taking a slow trip down the Yangtze, take it all the way to Shanghai. Shanghai. But wasn't the Grand Canal built during the Sui Dynasty? Yes, that's true. And it was used by the Tang and Song after that. Another continuity. But the change is that they expanded it. And that was just the most famous one. They had another tens of thousands of miles of waterways connecting different cities and regions of China together. And that means people all around China had access to the different specialty goods and the different kinds of food from other regions. Everybody gets a taste of that chunk of rice. <laughs> It's not just rice, but yes, it is a lot of rice. And by the way, who do you think was in charge of building all this infrastructure? I know, I know, the imperial bureaucracy. That's right, specifically the public works department. So you should be seeing that there's also a causation relationship between politics, technology, and economics. Yep, an efficient bureaucracy oversees technological innovations like the Grand Canal expansion, which leads to a stronger and more dynamic economy. And don't forget about culture. Those scholar bureaucrats are well-educated because of the Neo-Confucian revival. Nice job paying attention. Well, that's it for topic 1.1. Feel free to comment below if you have any questions or need some AP World advice. If you liked this video, then please like this video. And if you found it useful, please subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.